seated. Pastor, please come and bring us a word this morning. John chapter 1 in your Bibles this morning. John chapter 1. <coughs> Gospel of John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are lots of them available uh, just scattered around uh, underneath the, the chairs. They would be the black black uh, book that's under the chair racks. And I can tell you the page number, but the, they're not all the same. But if you are sitting next to someone, they're having a hard time finding the Gospel of John, uh, and help them out with it just a little bit. As you're turning there, we'll just have a couple of introductory comments. And let me just put a little plug for you uh, for the Gospel of John, some of the things that are unique about this study that we're in right now. First thing I would like to say is you couldn't have a better time to invite someone to come uh, to church and sit under the preaching of the Word of God than at a time when the Gospel of John is being preached. Because what we're going to see as we preach through the Gospel of John is not only who Jesus is, but we're going to see how to know God. How to know Jesus, who is God. And if you've got those questions, and you have uh, maybe sometimes if you're a thinker, you've asked a lot of questions, but sometimes you have to educate yourself to be able to ask questions. You ever learn a new field? Uh, you ever gotten into something and you realize, man, this is like a whole new world? Yep. And I don't even know what the questions are that I have. And as you learn, then you learn uh, things that you don't know. And then you start to ask questions that you don't know. John's one of those Gospels where you're going to learn things about Jesus that you never even wondered, never even asked the question of. But ultimately, uh, the Gospel of John is where Jesus is presented as one who is a Savior who can simply be received by our faith. And if you're asking the question about eternal life, what's going to happen to me when I face God? You're asking that question. The Gospel of John gives the simple answer in the words of Jesus Himself. Now, if you want to know uh, how to know that you have eternal life, I don't think there's a better expert on it than eternal God, is there? And that's who we saw Jesus is. We saw in the first week in our study of John that Jesus is eternal God who is responsible, literally the hand of God in creation. Uh, we compared and looked at uh, scriptures in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 30, and uh, verses 4 through 6 about uh, who Jesus is and, and uh, his, who Jesus is in the creation. We see that Jesus is from the beginning. We saw that Jesus is called the Word of God. The Word of God. And the question that we asked is, are we calling this book, which is the Word of God, is this Jesus? Uh, and we see Jesus is the incarnate Word. Or is Jesus literally God speaking to us? I love the way that Hebrews begins when the Bible talks about God who at sundry times and in diverse manners had spake to us in times past by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. So Jesus is God's spoken Word to us. He's also the one who spoke the world into existence by His Word. So the question is, is Jesus the Bible? Is He the Word of God? Or is Jesus God speaking to us as a person? And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, he is the Word of God. He's the Word of God in the flesh, the incarnate Word. Uh, and He also is this book. This is a personal preference, and it's not, I'm not trying to teach a doctrine here or get you to, to, you know, sometimes people get a little edgy about things that they just have a personal experience of. But, you know, I found that Jesus Christ is in every verse of this book. Right. You, can take, you can take every verse of every chapter in this book and understanding within its context, ultimately, it's about Jesus Christ. You know, Bible doctrine is Christocentric. You know, a lot of times, uh, Bible doctrine teaching is divided up into the theologies, you know, like Christology, uh, Soteriology, Amartiology, uh, you know, Angelology, Ecclesiology, where people teach doctrines, different doctrines in a system. But the reality of it is that every doctrine ultimately it teaches Jesus Christ, teaches us who Jesus Christ is. And so, uh, just wanted to mention that. We preached that message a couple of weeks ago. We're going to begin for the next couple of weeks to look at the ministry of the one who was the fourth teller, the preacher that said, this is, this is God's Son, John the Baptist, who is specially called for that ministry. And uh, we're going to read our context, this, or our text this morning for our context. And uh, we're not going to get too far. And I, I haven't set any lofty goals for how far we're going to make it 
in our chapter here today, so I think we're pretty realistic about where we'll be today. But I want to look at the person of John the Baptist, and I'll tell you why that's important here in just a minute. Will you look down to verse 19 of John chapter 1? We'll begin reading our text this morning. The Bible says, And this is the record of John, which when the Jews sent <coughs> priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Who are you? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, <coughs> What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, before we get into our text this morning, let's just ask God's help for a couple of things. I think that we should ask for understanding this morning, and I think that we should ask as well this morning for clarity, just that we could be very, very clear. And then ultimately, I want to ask that God would speak to us personally. Mm. And you know, we're not here today to be uh, intellectuals, are we? To know things that other people don't know, so we have answers that other people don't have. No, we're here today for God to speak to us. Let's just ask God to do that here this morning as we pray. Father, we're asking specifically for that this morning. We're asking that, first of all, <clears throat> you'd give us alertness, that you'd give us understanding, and then, God, we're asking that you'd speak to us by your word. Now we pray. I ask that you would just to help the messenger this morning, myself, God, to be very, very greatly diminished. And we would ask that the message this morning, which is Jesus Christ, would be greatly increased, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, this is the story of John the Baptist. And I want to just talk to you about why we're going to focus as we're preaching through the Gospel of John on the person of John the Baptist. And it would be specifically this. I learned years ago that following people, following men, has a lot of fallacies, doesn't it? When you follow a man, you'll be just fine until he veers away from following Jesus. And when a man's wrong and you're following a man, you'll be wrong when you follow him when he's not right. And you know what I find about men? I've never met one that wasn't, that didn't have fallacies. Have you? you ever met a perfect man? There is no such thing except for Jesus. Jesus is the only one who's ever lived on this earth and never sinned. Every man is a sinner. I like the way the Apostle Paul tells the churches that he wrote letters to and which he founded to follow him. He was defending his apostleship, the fact that God had called him to found churches and to be the, have authority in those churches. And one of the things Paul said to the people, for instance, in the church of Corinth was, follow me as I follow Christ. And you know, anyone who's conscientious about following Jesus could say that, and it would not be an arrogant thing. Sometimes I've met men that are more concerned about people being loyal to them than they are concerned with lifting people up to Jesus and pointing people to Jesus Christ and teaching them to be loyal to that same Christ. Listen, don't ever follow Pastor Price. Listen, if you think about me that I'm any different uh, than just a wicked sinner saved by grace, you think far too highly of me. I just promise you that. You, If you get to know me after a while, you'll realize, man, I'll tell you, I've got all kinds of things in my life, uh, not besetting sense, but I have all kinds of things in my life where I just ought to be more like Jesus. And uh, the Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. Even so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I appreciate it sometimes when you say, Pastor, you know, you're slipping in this area. This is an area where the Bible says, and this is what it looks like for you. And that's an encouragement to me, believe it or not. I don't need someone to follow me around and pretend to be God because I do have the Holy Spirit of God in my life. But it's a help to me. It's a help to me when people sometimes just make me aware of how human I am and what a sinful man I am. Don't follow me uh, to be like Ryan Price, but follow me as I follow Jesus. I just want to tell you something. I'm following Jesus. And anytime uh, we look at Jesus, 
or any time we preach the gospel, we ought to just be talking about Jesus. Let me just say something else. This is just personal. This is about my ministry and what I just feel convinced God would have uh, me to be. I don't want anyone ever to be impressed with me. I don't mean that. Uh, I don't mean that uh, in in the wrong way. What I mean by that is that if you ever think too much of me, you think too little of Jesus Christ. And so, just just don't think about me. You know what I find out in this? I'll help you with yourself as well. You know what I find out when I get to know uh, people? I, get to, I figure out that, uh, you know, people are all just people and everybody's the same, really. And that Jesus Christ is the one who is not like anyone else. And that He's different than everyone else. And so lift up Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus Christ. Don't think too much of a person. Think everything of Jesus because He'll never fail you. He'll never let you down. You'll never be disappointed by Him. I said all that to say we're going to talk about a person who is a good example, and that's the man that Jesus said there had never been a greater man on earth who'd ever lived, and that's John the Baptist. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about you? Could you imagine Jesus saying, we have John the Baptist here, right? That's what Brother John calls himself. John the Baptist, all his, uh, all his friends that aren't Baptists, he says, yeah, I'm John the Baptist. And uh, so, you know, can you imagine a, a person saying about you, Brother John, there's never been a greater man that's lived? Would you like for someone who speaks only the truth like Jesus to say that about you? No. Well, Pastor, you know, that'd just be prideful to think about myself in that way. I didn't tell you to think of yourself in that way. I'm asking whether or not you'd like Jesus to think you're the greatest man that ever lived. I would. I would. I, <laughs> I'm not under any delusions. Uh, I don't think that I'm the greatest man that's ever lived. I don't think I'm... I, well, I don't think much about myself at all, to be quite honest in that, in that sense. But I'll tell you this, I want to be great for Jesus. I don't want my life to be a waste. God created me for a purpose, and He didn't create anyone else to live my life. He created me for that purpose. And you know something? If I define greatness the way the world does, I'll have wasted my life. But if I define greatness the way Jesus does, it ought to be the thing I strive for on a daily basis. I ought to strive to be great the way that God calls greatness, what God defines greatness as. Everybody understand that? There's one last thing about thinking about yourself. You know most people don't think about you as much as you think people are thinking about you? Get over yourself. I've learned in trying to minister to people uh, that most of the time people aren't very interested in me. And it doesn't hurt my feelings any. It just helps me to be more effective in ministering to them. You know what every person's favorite subject is? Themself. Themself. And so don't be self-conscious. Just don't. You know, don't be thinking, well, I wonder what they're thinking about me. Most of the time they aren't at all. And you get all bent out of shape over what you think people are thinking. They're not thinking about you at all. They're thinking about themselves just like you're thinking about yourself. And so just, just be that way and then try to have the mind of Jesus that way. But it helps me a lot. I, I, I'm a lot less self-conscious when I realize, you know, people don't care that much about me anyway, so I don't need to worry about it. And uh, that that's not in a deprecating sense at all. That's just reality. And uh, just, just live for Jesus and think about Jesus. And think about representing Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you'll be able to live with a lot more confidence, a lot more joy in your life, and have a lot more purpose. Just get over yourself. And it'll be a big help to you in uh, preaching Jesus Christ. But John the Baptist was a man that Jesus said that there had never been a greater man that ever lived. The greatest man, not, G not besides God himself, that ever lived was John the Baptist. And my question is then, what made him so great? What made him so great? And uh, I'd like to take what Jesus said was great about John the Baptist, and I'd like for that to be true about me. Wouldn't you? And so in the next couple of weeks, we'll look at some characteristics about John the Baptist that made him great. Jesus asked the Pharisees the question uh, in, I believe it's Matthew's Gospel. Jesus asked the question, why did you go out in the wilderness? I'm summarizing. This is not a quote. He said, what went you out in the wilderness for to see? She said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Now, some of you all have an appreciation for remote places. And what you appreciate about remote places is the absence of other people. How many of you all understand what I'm saying? Or sometimes I like to go places where no one's at. I have two times a week, I have scheduled time when I just have about a couple of hours. I have just a couple of hours when no one's around. Now, I'll just tell you something. 
most of the time, you very, very seldom during a week see me separated from my wife being in the same place. In other words, we just spend all our time together most of the time. My wife's my favorite person. Uh, she's, she's, if you know her, you know why. I've had people say, you know, I know why you think your wife is so wonderful. Because she actually is, and she is a wonderful person. I like being around her. But there are a couple of times during the week, every week, when I try to not be around anybody at all. Because I just need some alone time, not to be with me, but to be with God. You know what I'm talking about? Just that, that time uh, to be able to think and reflect and not have anything, any other thing uh, coming into my thought process. And, you know, about <clears throat> once a year, I like to take some time, my wife and I both, when we leave South Florida and we go anywhere uh, to not be here, and which is our favorite place in the world to be, uh, because it's just nice to just get away just a little bit and be alone. One of my favorite places, and you folks that have been there, uh, one of my favorite places to just look at is when you go out west and you get into some of the barren areas of our country. It's pretty out west, isn't it? it, it my wife doesn't think so, but I do. My wife thinks that, de that the desert's not very pretty. She thinks cactuses are rather plain and so forth. But I just tell you, you go out there and look around, it's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. What I appreciate about the wilderness, we have some pretty neat wilderness area in the western United States. One of the neat things about it is just there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. I remember some years ago driving out through Nevada and I had my old 81 Volkswagen Rabbit. This is not that many years ago, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I had my 81 Volkswagen Rabbit and we were pulling a teardrop camper and we were driving through Nevada. It's one of those areas after you've gone through Utah and it says, you know, next service area, you know, which means next human life is like 110 miles or something. <laughs> and you're driving a car that, you know, most people think wouldn't go 100 miles. But you're already out in Nevada from Florida, so I mean, what's to worry about, right? But, you know, and, and, and you're, you're looking for fuel every time you can because it's just a long ways in between. You get out of those desert places and you're driving and, and you're watching, you know, your, your fuel gauge pretty carefully. And you realize, I haven't seen another human being. Been driving. 100 mile an hour. Not really, not an 81 rabbit. But I've uh, been driving for an hour and I haven't seen anybody coming the other way on the highway. I haven't seen anyone in over an hour. And you think, well, I'm really out in the middle of nowhere. I haven't seen any cattle for a while. I mean, just nothing out here. And I enjoy that. I appreciate that. That's what I go into the wilderness for to see. But Jesus asked, He said, what went you out in the wilderness for to see? And He was talking about John the Baptist. That's where John the Baptist preached. He preached outside of town. He didn't go into towns and the cities and preach. He preached in the outside of the towns and multitudes went out to see him. Thousands of people went out to hear John the Baptist preach. Think of that. Think about, you know, you're driving along, maybe you've come through Colorado and you're going on I-70, going west, and you've kind of gone into no man's land, and all of a sudden you see, you know, I don't know, 10,000 people, and a guy standing there talking to him. And you get in the crowd of the 10,000 people and you say, what are you guys here for? What's going on out here? I mean, if I saw 10,000 people out in the wilderness, I'm so what's everybody doing here? What's going on here? It's not Burning Man. Okay. It's, <laughs> what are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, I'd be out here to see this guy, John the Baptist. Well, what's special about him? Well, he's dressed special. Remember what John the Baptist wore? Somebody tell me, what did he wear? Camel hair. What? Camel's hair. Camel's hair. Camel's hair garment. You know that in, in his day, that wasn't like exotics, you know, fur, <laughs> camel's hair. That was cheap. Okay, that was, that was he didn't have anything else to wear, so he wore camel, camel skin. Okay, and what did he eat? Locusts and honey. Like, yeah, he's found this, you know, special diet, you know, and we're here to hear him talk. They weren't there to look at John the Baptist, and they weren't there to, to, to try his food. And there wasn't enough there anyway. What did they come for? What did they come to hear him for? Well, because he was had a powerful message. He had a powerful message. He came to hear what he had to say. And so he's out in the wilderness. He's preaching and he's baptizing people. This is not the same kind of baptism where the Bible, uh, when Jesus had been raised from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples that you're supposed to preach the gospel, teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then teach them to observe all things. It's not believer's baptism. It is believer's baptism, but a different kind. If you read in Acts and you see uh, when um, 
Apollos, right? It was Apollos that uh, had a good understanding of the Scripture, but he'd been baptized with John's baptism, which was foretelling that Jesus Christ is coming. But he didn't know that Jesus Christ had come, and Aquila and Priscilla uh, taught him the further things. That was the type of baptism it was. In other words, the baptism was, Jesus is here. Jesus is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's not the set up rule and reign kingdom, but the Christ who came to die on the cross for sins is here. That was John the Baptist's message. And to be quite frank with you, there was nothing impressive about John the Baptist as a person, but the message that he had, listen to me, was the most important message in the world. Because from the time that fir the first man sinned, judgment had come on mankind. And God had promised, read Genesis 3 carefully sometime and study it, God had promised that of the seed of the woman would be one that would bruise the serpent's head. The virgin birth was prophesied. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, was prophesied that He'd come. And for literally 4,000 years, the problem that man had, and that is that he's born the enemy of God, people had looked forward to this Savior coming to take care of the problem of sin. Can you imagine waiting 4,000 years? How many people survived waiting 4,000 years? Uh, only the generation that was born at the time of Jesus. Now, if I were to ask you a question, I, you, you'll get the answer wrong because I'll tell you you're wrong for a lot of reasons. Couldn't answer the question right. But if I were to ask you the question, what would be the best time to be alive from the history of the world until now? Don't you think that the time when Jesus Christ was born would be a pretty good time? Wouldn't it be like one of the best of times? Mm -hmm. It would be incredible, wouldn't it, to with your eyes see the Son of God? Now, today, Jesus told His disciples that we live in a better time because Christ lives in us when we're His children. So today's actually a better time than that. But you know, that would be one of the top ones on my list, wouldn't it, for you? And John the Baptist was the preacher that was supposed to prepare for the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see marks about John the Baptist that made him, uh, that qualified him for that. They asked him the question, though, this is who? These are the religious Jewish leaders, the Levites and the priests. In verse 19, they said, Who are you? Who are you? Implied in the question was, You seem to have great power in your message. You seem to be someone like we've never seen in our lifetimes. God had been silent for Israel for over 400 years. They'd never seen a man that had God's power in their lives. And they said, who are you? And the question really was, are you Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Anointed One? Is that, that who you are? In verse 20, he confessed and denied not, but said, I am not the Christ. Andrew, was it you and I that were having a discussion about some false religious leader that said that he wasn't Christ, but people worshipped him? Was it what? Who was this we were talking about? Some guy, but his, his conclusion was, you know what, I don't want to take away the people's joy, so he just let them worship him anyway. You know, I'm really not Christ, but it's okay to worship him. You know, you know a, lot of, a lot of men are happy to have people impressed with them. It, it, it breaks my heart sometimes when I'm trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and they tell me about religious leaders they're impressed with. Don't, don't use this as anything more than just an illustration that pops into my head. But you know, that's what bothers me about Joel Osteen a lot. There are so many people that are lost that think Joel Osteen is the most wonderful thing in the world. And that's too bad, isn't it? You know, you don't listen to Joel Osteen and leave thinking, man, Jesus is really something. Hmm. You think, man, that guy's got a great mullet. You know, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> that was for you, Frank. All right. Uh, you know, people go, oh, he's got such a motivational message. And you know what he tells me? Right. Makes me feel so good. Right. You know? Right. Uh, and you, you always leave impressed with Joel Osteen, but you're never impressed with Jesus. Mm -hmm. and you know, as a man, it it's kind of feels good to have people be impressed mm -hmm. with you. Thanks. Remember what happened to the king that Daniel served under? Who they made the, you remember the, the men came and they had him make a law that he is the only person that could be prayed to. Uh, for, was it, 30 days? And I mean, it just appealed to him. He should have known he wasn't God and that people shouldn't pray to him. He, I mean, he honestly loved Daniel and it seemed like he feared God. But he just, man, it'd be nice to have people pray to me. And he was okay with people looking up to him. And you know, men are susceptible to that. 
You watch out. You watch out for prominence. Man, I'll tell you, sometimes prominence, we want people to, to really be impressed with us and think we're something. The Bible says John the Baptist confessed and denied not. He said, oh, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. He confessed and denied not. I'm not the Christ. If that's who you think I am, I'm not. So who is John the Baptist? What's a great man? Well, a great man is someone who knows who Jesus is and knows that they're not. That's just practical. Now, verse 21. And they asked him, What then art thou Elias? Now, Jesus said that, that John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. He was the Elijah that was supposed to come. And that his message was Elijah's message. But John knew who he was. He said, I'm John. I, I'm, not, I'm not Elias. He said, are, they, are you that prophet? He answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou thyself? He said, well, then who are you? And he said, I'm this person. You ever heard of this guy? I'm the voice of one that crieth in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the, saith the prophet Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 40. Let's look at that, shall we? Isaiah chapter 40. If you're taking notes in your Bible, and sometimes you want to know where it's at when the Scripture quotes the Scripture, uh, John the Baptist is quoting Isaiah chapter 40 here. So you can jot that down uh, next to your verse right there in, in the Gospel of John chapter uh, 1. I'm sorry? 43? No, 3. Oh, verse 3, yes. No, I'm in Ezekiel. My Bible's saying the wrong thing and my phone's ringing at the same time, so I'm distracted. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Sometimes I want to answer because it's a Miami number calling during church. I want to know about services in Miami Beach. And I try to answer the phone all the time for our church, but I just can't possibly. And folks down there don't know that I'm in church right now. And so I... A lot of times I have a lot of distractions. I get distracted when you all write notes to each other. And then I get distracted when you're sleeping. I get distracted when my phone rings and I'm trying to preach too. So my apologies. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40. All right. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And here's a description of straight. What's the shortest distance between uh, two points? A straight line. A straight line over hills and through valleys? Or a straight line over a plain? Over a plain, right? Mm -hmm. So you could take a straight line, and if, you, if it had to go up over a dip or something like that, the line would be longer. If it had to go around something, it would be longer. John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and his job was to make straight the way, the mm. pathway of the Lord. So what was his ministry? His ministry was to create a direct line to Jesus. That's who he was. He was an individual that was creating a direct path to Jesus. Now listen to me, friend. We're going to read more about this here, and we're almost done with the message today. But I want us to get this here today. You know how greatness is? As far as what a man can be, Greatness is when a man makes a direct path for someone else to the Lord Jesus. That was John's job, John's position. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world about Jesus. And he said, That's Him. That's the person I was preaching about. This is the one that I said would be sent. John's disciples left and started following Jesus. I mean, as soon as he said, there he is, they said, okay, see you, John. <laughs> How would you feel if you were John? Right. Remember when the people came to him? We'll see this in a couple of weeks, but they came to John and they said, uh, you know, <clears throat> Jesus is making more disciples than you are. And here John is in prison because he told uh, Herod that it was wrong for him to have taken his brother's wife. He shouldn't have taken your brother's wife. And so his brother's wife got mad. She had him put in prison. And he's in prison, and his disciples come and give a report, and they say, you know, John, you, you just, you're not missed. Nobody misses you, because they're all following Jesus now. And, G and John said what? A servant is not greater than his master, or a disciple than, is a disciple than his Lord. Hmm. And then he said, he must increase, I must decrease. 
One of the things that made John the Baptist a great man was that he pointed people straight to Jesus. And when he pointed people straight to Jesus, he got himself out of the way and did not resent. Going from being the person that multitudes came into the wilderness to see to being someone who's in prison and nobody even cares. You know, that doesn't fly too well with some of us, does it? You know, in our nature, we want to be at least recognized, don't we? Oftentimes. We want people to at least acknowledge what we've done. Hey, gratitude's an important thing for people to have. But do you know something that shouldn't be important for me is for people to express gratitude toward me. In other words, it's a bad thing for you if you don't appreciate someone who serves you or who does something for you. That's a bad attitude for you to have. But do you know it's a bad attitude for me to need your gratitude? Hmm. Or for you to need someone else's gratitude? John did. John was a unique guy in this sense. Let's look at verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 40 briefly. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now let me take a moment here to defend my home state. And... <laughs> It's not true. There are, if you're ever from Kansas, there's two terrible things that people do to you. You know, I've been from Florida longer than I've been from Kansas, but it still offends me when people bash Kansas. I, I didn't leave Kansas because I didn't like it. I, I was called to be in South Florida and to minister to the people here. Uh, where I lived in Kansas is really beautiful. Matter of fact, our family had a beautiful property there. We have three miles of river on our farm, and we have uh, bottom ground with uh, the biggest deer in the world. I mean, just big white-tailed bucks. And, and uh, we have pasture land with massive flood rocks. It's just really pretty country. If you like to kill animals, wild animals, no. it's, one of the, oh, <laughs> it's one of the greatest places in the world to get some food. Uh, so, oh, now, now okay, you're not leaving too, are you, brother? <laughs> okay. Man, wow. <laughs> See, I'm not like Jesus, am I? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's not flat where I grew up in Kansas. But one of the things they do in Kansas, especially on the highways, is they don't make you drive over hills. They, they uh, hammer out the rock and make it so you can drive through. You go through, like, uh, Fort Riley or Junction City, Kansas, to go through the Flint Hills of Kansas. Uh, one of the things that you'll see a lot of times is that you look on the sides of you and you're driving, like, through this two walls of rock. There was a hill there. Instead of making you drive over the hill, they just jackhammered a hole out through the middle so you could go straight through. And one thing they don't do is drive around things in Kansas. <laughs> if you fly overhead in Kansas, it looks like patchwork. Everything is a perfect square. Everything's one mile square. Mile this way, mile this way, mile this way, mile this way. You run around a block in Kansas, you ran four miles <laughs> because it's a mile every way. Not in town. I'm talking about in the country, folks, okay? Uh, there's so you can go down there. You have streets too, okay, and 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 uh, we have doors on our houses and sidewalks and pavement. I had to educate my wife on all these things when we first. Met. She said, "I can't believe you live in a house like yeah, that. You guys have a house in town. You know, I, th I always just envision like this screen door with a spring on it. You know, to, it's like no, we're real people. We live there. You know, so, so. But one of the things they do in Kansas is they make crooked ways straight. And they, uh, if there's if there's a valley to go through, they hammer out a rock and a hill, and they fill the valley with the hill. They make straight roads, because hmm. we know what straight is in Kansas. Okay, straight paths. John here is actually illustrating this. Instead of going around a mountain or going over something or going under something, what he's saying is right to Jesus. I'm the person. My ministry is to make a straight path to Jesus. I don't want you to have to go up to get to Jesus. Don't want to have, you have to go down to get to Jesus. Don't want you to have to go right to get to Jesus or left to get to Jesus. If my ministry does what it's supposed to do, you're supposed to see right to Jesus. And that was his ministry. Now, he said a couple of things about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 40. We'll look at those things so that we can see what he was explaining. First of all, the message that he cried is in verse 6. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. 
And then verse 7, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. And here's the point. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. All flesh is as grass. Now, if you've tried to grow grass and grow good grass around here, you know what a struggle it is. Sure. We have some weeds in South Florida that are just the... I don't think there's any chemical that will kill them. You have to pull them out uh, by hand. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I've had good grass in my yard for probably a uh, solid seven days about every three years. Uh, it's about the, the, I just get pretty discouraged about trying to grow grass. I grew up on a farm. I know how to grow things. But grass is tough to grow because of just weeds. And, man, I'll tell you, St. Augustine, I don't know who came up with that, uh, with the St. Augustine grass. But it's not great grass, folks. I just, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. It, it, it is susceptible to so many things. Man, if it gets too much water, it dies. If it doesn't get enough water, it dies. If it gets too much sun, it dies. If it doesn't get enough sun, it dies. And then Johnson grass, Johnson grass just gets in and you can't get it out. Now whatever those old bush you look at, I forget the name of the things that look like weeds. And then uh, the goose grass, or the, the, uh, what's the purple snow flowers that grow over everything and you let them get in your yard. They'll take over in a week and your St. Augustine will just get choked out uh, just like that. My point is this, I can have beautiful grass one week and, and within the next week of not taking care of it, it's just destroy my yard Amen. my lawn Amen. is decimated right now it's so hard to grow good grass That's just good. tough you grass people you know this it's work if you have good whenever i see somebody has good grass i'm like man you work hard at your grass i'll go to church instead but you <laughs> you work hard on your grass because it's a lot of work to have good grass in south florida one of the things about grass is that it dies it fades now uh these uh the dunfords brought mrs price some flowers for her birthday and these are beautiful, aren't they? I wonder how they look in a month. <laughs> aren't they lovely? I was hoping I'd have some live flowers and dead flowers here. So we've got some live ones. Come back in a month and have a look. Things just die, don't they? And then you know what the Bible says about people? The flesh is this. It's, it's what we're made of. Uh, carne, it's, it's, it's the, the meat that covers our bones. The Bible says flesh is this grass. All flesh is this grass. You know, John's message to people was a message that pointed him to Jesus. But his message about people was life's a vapor, just like James said. Flesh is temporary. You ever realize how fast you get old? How many people here realize? I don't think there's anybody here that feels old intellectually. Like you, your body's convinced you that you can't do things you once did. There were some, some videos of the kid teenagers riding a bull. Uh, you know, the, the mechanical ball at the activity yesterday. You know what you didn't get a video of? Pastor Price riding a mechanical ball <laughs> yesterday. And I was goaded into it by several people. Will Rice came over, hey, Pastor, you're going to get on that ball? I know you could ride a ball, you know. And then everybody, oh, you should get on the ball. You should ride the ball. You know what I didn't do? I did not get on that ball yesterday. <laughs> because my body convinced me some years ago that riding any kind of a bowl and falling off of things has major dire consequences. <laughs> because I'm old. When I was 18, I promise you, I'd have gotten the best uh, time of anybody on that bowl. And if somebody got a better time, I'd have ridden until I got a better one than you. Not anymore. And y'all can do that now. And I said right back to him, I said, you've never been on that bowl yourself and you're trying to get me on there. I know how this is. And yeah, yeah, we don't ride the bowl either. No. <laughs> you know? Why? Because flesh is as grass. And things break on me. I was leaning out over my seawall a couple weeks ago. My back went out. I didn't do anything. I was just leaning over my seawall. And I ran into the screen door when you guys were over there. And my big Tashi hurt my back a couple weeks ago. And, uh, man, I mean, and I was miserable for a couple of weeks. This flesh is as grass. And it's just going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Intellectually, I know I'm old. But in my mind, I still feel like I've just gotten started. Like I've just begun life. You know, when I get to be 100 years old, I hope I don't actually. But if I got to be 100 years old, it happens like that. And it's just over. My 100-year-old aunt, she died a couple of years, or about a year and a half ago. And, uh, you know, she just talked about how fast life goes. How quickly it goes by. And that brings us to something, and that is the temporary nature of the life that we live. And John the Baptist wanted people to know. 
you're not going to live forever. Matter of fact, you're not going to live very long. You know, the world's 6,000 some odd years old. And that really isn't that long if you've ever lived any period of it. You think about it, it's just not that long. A lot of people only live a few years. Most live fewer than 80 years, and many live less than 100 years. And uh, we're just really temporary. But you know something that isn't temporary? Jesus. Jesus was eternal God from the beginning. That's what John, the Gospel of John, taught first thing. Jesus Christ was there before the foundation of the world. All flesh is as grass. <clears throat> the Bible says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Verse 8, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You know, this book's been true. It's been true for thousands of years, folks. It doesn't have a beginning. It's eternal. It's the eternal Word of God. Jesus is God, and God doesn't have a beginning, but you do and I do. And you and I have an end, but Jesus doesn't. And John said, if I'm going to make straight the way of the Lord, one of the things that I want to do is to contrast the difference between flesh and eternal God, who is Jesus Christ. Now, friend... That brings us today to a natural conclusion, and that is that we've all got the problem of mortality, doesn't it? I don't know how long I'm going to live. I tell you, I've been with people that one day are the picture of health, and within a week's time, their health has gone down and they're gone. I don't know when that will happen to me, if it will happen that way for me, but it's most certain that the Lord Jesus tarries that this guy here one day it's just going to be gone. Because flesh is as grass. But you know something that won't actually ever happen to me? I'm never going to die. Amen. Never going to die. Ever. You know why? Because the Word of God, the Word of the Lord, liveth forever. In other words, I have an eternal Savior who's given me eternal life. Because of that life, my friend, death no longer matters. Amen. Jesus was God's Son. And he came to earth to die a physical death for sin, which He never committed, for sinners who deserve the death themselves. But Jesus didn't stay dead, my friend. He suffered God's wrath he was three days in the grave and He rose again. And by you and I accepting what Jesus did on our behalf, dying for our sins, you and I can have His life. In other words, we give Him our death and He takes our life. <clears throat> and friend, when you get the kind of life that Jesus Christ gives, a couple of things instantly happen. I don't have time to develop this today. We're going to develop it in the next couple of weeks. A couple of things happen. First of all, God's Spirit comes in you. Amen. You're here today. You've never had that experience. My friend, all I can tell you is that you can and that if you receive Jesus as your Savior, you'll know what we're talking about, but it won't mean much more than that to you. In other words, you have to receive Jesus to have God's Spirit live in. You can't experience it any other way. But when you receive Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you get eternal life. The flesh is as grass. Your flesh will die, but you spiritually will never die. You'll never perish. Amen. And that's the message. That's the person. That's the Jesus that John the Baptist was preaching. In conclusion here today, let me say, I have not explained the Gospel here this morning in the sense of how to be saved, how to receive Jesus as your Savior. So I'll do that as we conclude this morning. Jesus was God's Son. He was born of a virgin as the Scripture prophesied. When the Scripture prophesied. How the Scripture prophesied. He fulfilled every prophecy of the Scripture for the Messiah. He was born of a virgin. He lived on this earth a sinless life. He was crucified. He laid His life down. He allowed Himself to be crucified. To die. To suffer as a man. And to die for sin 
but he never sinned because his death was a substitution. He died in our place. Took our death for him. Or took our, took our death on him. And Jesus told us that, that having eternal life was as simply as receiving what he did for us when he died on the cross for our sins. In other words, our being saved from our sin by what Jesus did is as simple as receiving a gift. How do you receive a gift? You accept it. I couldn't put it more simply than Jesus did. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the same way must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We know the next verse, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus said, Receiving the gift of eternal life is as simple as believing. Now sometimes we take the word believing and we make it complicated. We qualify in so many ways that you'd never be able to do it. But what Jesus meant when He said believing, He illustrated. When the children of Israel complained about Moses and were bitten by a poisonous serpent so that they died, all they had to do to live was to look at the serpent that was raised in the middle of the camp. And anyone that looked, lived. That's what believing is, looking to Jesus. How do you actually do that? Well, by telling Jesus what's in your heart. Here's how I did it when I was a child. I understood I was a sinner. It took some convincing, but I was convinced. And I understood I deserved death because of my sin. I also understood that Jesus died for my sin. And man, did I want to be born again. I wanted the gift. And you know what I did? I asked for it. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sin. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. Yeah. It isn't those exact words. It's, that, it's, that, it's what's in your heart. You know what my dad prayed when he got saved? Jesus, save me. Amen. I want to be saved, Jesus. Him, everything in that statement is implied. That he's a sinner. That Jesus died for his sin. And that he wanted to receive Jesus as his Savior. You know, you could do the same thing. You say, Pastor, I need to have more knowledge first. Well, do you believe Jesus is God? Do you believe that He died for your sins? Do you want to be saved because of what Jesus did? Listen, my friend, you can't delete your sin. The Bible says all sin comes short of the glory of God. If God judges you in your sin, you'll go to hell forever. That's reality. That's the simple truth. Good works don't make bad works go away. Can you imagine mm -hmm. a convict using that? <laughs> Well, you know, ever since I murdered that person, I've done some really good things. You say, Pastor, I'm not a murderer. No, but you're a sinner, and sin is against God, and God doesn't forget anything. And by the way, God doesn't forgive anything. You say, what? No, God judges everything, and when God forgives you, it's because He judged His Son in your place. And just, oh, I'm sorry. Well, then I forgive you. No, God said, well, then somebody's going to have to die. And so he had his son die because he loved you so much. Mm -hmm. Would you receive him? Whew. Make straight the way of the Lord. Pray the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. Father, I pray that you would help us to see not only the message that John the Baptist preached, but that you would help us to see the importance. The importance of being like John the Baptist. Literally pointing people directly to Jesus. <clears throat> I want to ask everyone to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm not going to finish my prayer just for a minute, but I want to talk to you. We've just spoken to God before we finish our prayer. I want to just ask a simple question today, and that would be this. Has God spoken to you today about your need for eternal life to receive Jesus? I'm not talking about as pastor spoken to you, but has the Holy Spirit of God touched your heart? Has He put a finger on something? Has He given you conviction? Can I say to you, you don't need anything more than God talking to you to know who He is and know that He's real. You say, well, I need more evidence. I need to know if God's spoken to you, my friend. What do you want? If the Holy Spirit of God said to you today, you need to receive my Son. You need to, you need to trust me. You need to pray for eternal life. That's the message for you, and it's as plain as it could be, and if you'll be honest about it, you could receive it. You know what your answer ought to be? Yes, God, I want the gift of eternal life. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Would you tell God that right now? Right where you're sitting there. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want eternal life. 
You ever done that before, my friend? That's, that's what the invitation's for for you today. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want eternal life. You're here today and you're a believer and sometimes you get confused about what greatness is and you forget that greatness is really just pointing people right to Jesus. Getting everything out of the way, including yourself. And God's shown you specifically maybe areas of your life, maybe giving you conviction for it. You say, Pastor Price, would you pray for me? Don't embarrass me. Don't call me out. But God's shown me that sometimes I'm more of a distraction than a help in pointing people to Jesus. And I'm going to respond to what God said to me today. Just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up right now. Yep, just slip right back down. Right up, right back down. Okay, so let's do business with God right now then. You tell God what you've told me as we finish our prayer. Father, thank you so much for your spirit that speaks to us, that takes simple truth and applies it. And I just pray that, Lord, for those that would be here today that do not know Jesus as their Savior, God, I just ask that your spirit would be the convincer, that you'd be the one that would say, you know, you can have all the evidence you need to support it, but you know what's true because of what my spirit said to you today. Pray today be their day of salvation. Pray for believers that are here. And we, Lord, sometimes we become a distraction or we become more focused about ourselves rather than pointing people to You. And we've lost the idea, lost the understanding that flesh is temporary, but the Word of the Lord is forever. Jesus is forever. And I just pray that that truth, God would convince us on how we ought to live in, in, in regard to that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn this morning to conclude our service. And the hymn, the time that we sing the hymn, we're going to sing page 248 in the blue hymn book, so you can find that right now. The time that we sing that will be a time when we would invite you to respond if God spoke to your heart today. Now, that could be very simple. It's not a high-pressure place. It's a small place. Every person here has access enough to be able to talk to me if you'd like to. So if you'd say, Pastor, you know, while we sing the hymn, I'd like someone to pray with me or... I'm going to tell God something. I'd like another believer to be a witness with me about the same thing. Well, friend, I'd be happy to do that. And as we sing a hymn this morning, I'd be happy to be a witness for you about that. The second thing this morning uh, during the invitation would be if God's spoken to you about something, you know, He'll put His finger on things I never said or I never knew. And the reason God talks to you is not so that you can say, oh, God's talking to me. That's wonderful, isn't it? But God talks to you so you can listen and respond. And so the invitation is a time when you respond. So while we sing our hymn of invitation this morning, would you just respond to it? I asked Brother Andrew. Where is Brother Andrew? Oh, there you go. Right in front. Same place he always is. I look right through him. Uh, I'm going to ask him to come up and lead us in our hymn of invitation. And you respond as God's laid on your heart. Maybe while we're singing, you just remain in your seat and do business with God. Or maybe bow your head while we're singing and, and, and tell God uh, yes to whatever He's spoken to you about. Or it might be you need to say, Pastor, I need to be saved. Could somebody open a Bible and help me with that? And we'll do that as well during the invitation. All right? So you move as God's moved you, okay, in the invitation. Brother Andrew, will you come and lead us in our hymn of invitation this morning? Page 248. Please stand. Let's stand. While we pray.